I won't for the pursuit of truth. So I mentioned this in the last one. Um, there was a bit on Sky News about it, so I thought I'd bring it, bring it to you um, about the attack on Q um, yesterday. Just to show that, you know, that another war that's happening, there's many wars, not all of them are reported, but there's loads of wars. There's a war in Sudan, isn't there? There's loads of them that are happening, the suffering that's going on, the suffering that war brings, where one human set of humans fight another set of humans, usually over what? What is the war usually over? Land, occupation, who's going to take control, who's going to have power over a certain amount of people, or the threat that that people pose to you. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Well, how do we live like this when we're all human beings? I know that sounds very cumbia, very flower power, but in reality, how is it we got to this stage where we can hate each other, where we're exactly, we're biological copies of each other? When we're babies, we're blank, we have nothing, we love each other, and we fill ourselves full of all this stuff and reinforce it throughout life and create patriotism and create this divide this Im imaginary divide that people thousands of years created when they divided us all up anyway so obviously russia is saying that they didn't hit the children's hospital or that there might be militia there although there's a picture showing a rocket flying into what they claim is the the children's hospital and it's a cancer children's hospital to make it even worse and like it's nonsensical you know why why you would attack a can children's chan cancer hospital it doesn't well, it certainly doesn't help russia's cause for the uh, the rest of the world unless they want to inflict this kind of pain and suffering and force ukraine into submission that way which of course is very possible i know these things happened in the second world war i've been watching this program about uh, nazis and, and hitler in the second world war netflix is really interesting maybe i'll make a program on it at some point and the danger and how slow it took for Hitler. You know, it wasn't just a fast thing. It was a slow burning thing. And yet it ended up in this major world war. I wonder whether we're at the footsteps of, of that and, and here. But just to hear like the, the different sides wrangling and sort of one saying this, one saying that. You know, <laughs> uh, the military obviously rubbing their hands because they can now have an excuse to increase budgets. And to, you know, because they say the world is dangerous and it's a threat and this, that and the other. And this is just human beings, other human beings, just like us, just like you, just like me, with families. We're busying our time fighting over these things, missing out the bigger picture that we're all one and that there's no need for any of this. I don't know. Anyway, here's another example of the failing of humanity again today amid growing calls for him to end his bid for re-election more on that shortly but i want to start with ukraine a major attack there today means the country will be top of the agenda at tomorrow's washington summit at least 31 people are dead and more than 130 injured after several cities were bombed the most shocking incident though a children's hospital looking after cancer patients almost completely destroyed Well, Ukrainian officials reported attacks in six cities across the country, killing more than 30 people. Sky News' data and forensics team has located missile attacks to a business park, a private clinic, as well as a children's hospital, the largest children's hospital in the country. The hospital is near government ministries. Russia claims they were targeting military industrial infrastructure. Our defense and security editor, Deborah Haynes, has more. This is meant to be a sanctuary for Ukraine's most poorly children. Instead, it's become a war zone. Trauma for the tiniest of patients. Young boys and girls battling serious illness, now forced onto a new front line. The hospital basement is where many parents took their children for shelter as Russia launched a barrage of missiles towards Kyiv and other cities. But any kind of movement is dangerous for the most vulnerable. 
We first heard the explosion. It wasn't far away. We reacted quickly. My daughter started screaming. I didn't think this could happen, that there could be an attack on a hospital where there are sick children. Footage captured the moment the missile struck Ukraine's main children's hospital. Other images showed the aftermath. Russia confirmed its military had launched missile strikes against Ukraine, but said the targets had been military manufacturing sites and air force bases. No sign of either here. Nor at this residential block, also in Kyiv. We went to the corridor during the air alarm, and we saw the fire and heard how the rocket was flying, and the explosion took place. Ukraine's president called for more Western support on a trip to Poland. Ukraine is now initiating the convening of an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council in connection with the Russian attack on civilian infrastructure, including a children's hospital. Many see the attacks as a deliberate ploy by Russia to dominate the agenda on the eve of a major NATO summit of world leaders in Washington. This is par for the course for Mr. Putin to hit civilian infrastructure, and he doesn't care whether he's hitting hospitals or residential buildings. Um, I, I can't draw the line that, that this is some sort of message. But look, I mean, uh, as I said, what you're going to see over the course of the week is a very set of, of strong signals and messages to Mr. Putin that he can't wait NATO out, can't wait the United States out, that we're going to continue to support Ukraine. US we are defending not just our home and our city and our country. We're defending every one of you because Putin goes so far as far we are allowed to go. The latest devastation, the starkest of reminders of what's at stake. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Well, I can now speak to a doctor who works at the Children's Hospital, Lesia Lesitschia. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us here on the program. I've seen some of your images, and we're going to show it to our viewers in a moment. But it was a devastating incident, especially uh, devastating for everyone inside that hospital. Uh, it's even impossible to explain what we are all feeling now. Uh, because for us, our hospital was like a, a place of power and a, like perfect hospital. And it's really very hard to imagine uh, that the same people as we can attack pediatric hospital. Uh, it's one of the biggest hospitals with a lot of uh, patients with serious disease who need medical support 24 hours for seven days and now it's really very destroyed. At the moment of attack, we all was in the hospital and continue our work. And- um, Yeah, just um, describe to me the moment uh, the, the airstrike took place, uh, because of course we've seen the aftermath, but what happened inside the hospital once you realized you were under attack? Uh, you, you know, we all have terrible feelings and afraid that it can happen. And we imagine how it can happen. We discuss it exactly with, with colleagues. Uh, first, what you saw when you near the hospital, the light, then your sound, it's awful sound, and then you don't hear nothing, except you realize that you need to go outside and see what, what happens and where you can be useful. Uh, so it's uh, really the image, a building is nothing. Um, uh, thanks to God, no, uh, almost all our doctors are safe and they stay uh, alive. But um, at the moment when you see the wall is falling down, uh, you realize that the awful things which you afraid can happen exactly happen at this moment. And every doctor firstly take care of their patients and then go to the emergency room and help to injure people. Yes, doctor, tell me, because at the time of the attack, 
Um, there were surgeries taking place, for example. Uh, there are patients in there, children in there, who have uh, all sorts of illnesses and, and can't be in an environment that, you know, half the hospital is under rubble. They need to be in very clean environments. They need medical attention and care, their own medicine at all times. How are you dealing with, with the scale of this and, and all of these children? Uh, so at this moment, uh, we uh, manage it between the Kyiv hospital. We contact with other hospital and we evacuate all patients to other hospital in the same condition. But um, the uh, patients who can stay at home or at least in clean, uh, not in the hospital or at least not uh, so uh, with, with not so severe illness. They stay in the flat near the hospital. We so actually we divided patients in three groups who need immediately help, and they were sent like a first line. Then who need to be uh, sent it because they are planning to have planning surgery or etc. We just put it on a pause for two days to manage where we can continue our work. And the third patients which are have planning and it can be delayed. So we ask them to go home and uh, wait for our contact with them. For tomorrow, I have a big surgery uh, day. Uh, I talk with the, one of the private hospital and all surgery go to this hospital. It will be, uh, patient will be operated without any payment. So we decided to contact between the doctors, uh, between the private hospital who can, can take care of our patients. And do you think that um, eventually your hospital can be fully up and running? Because we have seen those images of the rubble, for example, and doctors, nurses, um, you know, other staff trying to um, work through that rubble. Uh, will the hospital be, be functioning, fully functioning in the immediate future, or are you still waiting to see uh, what happens next? Uh, no, firstly, we need to see how... Uh uh, how many damage, damage we have, but uh, for sure we will back to fully uh, functional in the nearest time because the worst things which can happen with us is to stop to walk and to stop to live. So we uh, make as, as much as is possible to continue work in the nearest day. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sistia, thank you so much uh, for joining us here on the program. Thank you very much for your interest. Well, the UN Secretary General has condemned the attack, but Russia denied targeting civilian infrastructure. Our Moscow correspondent, Ivor Bennett, joins me now live. And uh, Ivor, this was an incredibly brazen attack in broad daylight. We did see these sorts of attacks in places like Mariupol at the very beginning of this conflict, but certainly not in the center of the capital in Kiev, um, in, certainly not you know, in recent months and, and at least in the last year. Well, there are differing accounts over what caused this destruction at the Children's Hospital. As we've seen and heard, Ukraine is adamant that Russia was deliberately targeting civilians here, deliberately setting its sights on the Children's Hospital. They say they have evidence. They say they're going to share that evidence with the International Criminal Court in The Hague. But Russia is saying they've done nothing of the sort. They, the Ministry of Defense here has put out a statement in English on the social media platform Telegram saying that they carried out airstrikes on defense industry targets and aviation bases in Ukraine. There's no mention of a children's hospital. In this statement, though, they do refer to the footage and photos of the destruction that we saw in Deborah's report there. Um, but they claim that this was the work of Kiev and the Ukrainian air defense missile, uh, appearing to suggest that this was a deliberate act of self-harm. Um, they don't provide any evidence to back up that claim, um, but they do suggest a reason, suggesting that um, it's an attempt by Ukraine to garner support from NATO. I think what this really underlines is there's, a, there's two wars being fought here in Ukraine, the one on the battlefield and the one in the information space, the propaganda war. Yeah, uh, indeed. And, and although uh, we focused on the hospital and, and the children there, um, as we reported earlier, there have been a number of other cities targeted and attacked across uh, Ukraine. Um,
but of course, um, business as usual uh, in Moscow, including a visit from the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Yeah, that's right. And I think the timing of all of this is, is, is no coincidence coming on the eve of this NATO summit in Washington. Because what is not in denial here from Moscow is the fact that they've stepped up their aerial offensive um, on, on Ukraine here. And it feels like Russia has very much kind of flexed its muscles here, show the West that they have the upper hand on the battlefield, that in their view is pointless and futile to continue supporting Ukraine. But as you say, Narendra Modi is here. here. Here are the pictures from this evening, him being welcomed by Vladimir Putin at his residence just outside Moscow. And I think this is what Russia also wants the West to take notice of, because this is an ally of the West and a key trading partner for Moscow. And if you're Vladimir Putin and you want to show the West that the attempts to isolate you aren't working, that you still have friends everywhere, then what better time to welcome the leader of a country like India it serves the uh, perfect visual antidote to a NATO summit. And I think the, the visit at the end of last week, the surprise visit from Viktor Orban, Hungary's leader, to Russia, served a similar purpose for the Kremlin, um, because this was an EU and NATO member shaking hands with the alliance's arch enemy. So put all this together, what's happened in Ukraine, Narendra Modi's visit, Viktor Orban's visit last week, it feels like this is another power play from Vladimir Putin and an attempt, perhaps, to try and make the West rethink their strategy when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, indeed, the United States always describing India as its strategic partner, certainly when it comes uh, to dealing with uh, China. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ivor, for, for the latest there from Moscow. Now, I don't know. It is a bit worrying, isn't it, all this? Especially when you watch history, when cause it, there's some sort of similarities I mean, maybe jumping the gun a little bit and looking for things, but um, obviously in the in this um, the rise of the Nazis, and it's all on Netflix. Um, I think I mentioned it already on the Pursuit of Truth. So it mentions how Hitler, you know, he had to. It took him time before he became Chancellor, and then it took him time before he convinced people and you know became the Fuhrer and etc. It wasn't like everyone thinks, oh, 1939, that's the start of all this. It was the early 30s when this all started. It took him years to, to get into the positions to create the, uh, the SS and all that kind of stuff, to, to, to form the alliances. Like the, it just reminded me when India came up, because India obviously got a, million, a billion people, they're uh, a nuclear power, but they're also friends with the West, they're friends with Russia. And it just reminded me of how Hitler, he garnished support from someone, uh, Stalin, isn't it? And a few others that um, he didn't like, but he wanted them to be on his side and struck deals to work together. I don't know, it's just all... And obviously Hitler, when you hear about Hitler and uh, his ideology of when he was young, he wanted to, you know, <laughs> to echo like to make it simplified a bit like what Donald Trump says, not to align him with it, but make like Germany great again is what Hitler wanted to do, isn't it? He was very interested in histor history and, you know, joining Austria back to, to Germany. Um, and, you know, he felt that, I think after the First World War, that Germany was humiliated the way that it gave up that war, which he was involved in a little bit. And so therefore he wanted that history of uh, uh, like, because he wanted, it wasn't it, a thousand year Reich. You know, that's very sort of Rome and it's very sort of historical based. And of course we all know that Putin is exactly the same. They talk about him in exactly the same way. That he, is it Bolsheviks or whatever, he's very history orientated and wants like Russia to be back to the USSR. Um, I suspect he was, was he part of um, the USSR back? Um, I know, wasn't he in the, um, not the Kremlin, what's it called? The KGB. Um, so maybe he's in that same mindset. And it, it, it's a, the, sort of the parallels of the, the, the rise of the, the right wing. We're seeing it in France. We're seeing it like with the Reform Party. We're seeing it, you know, the Rwanda policy from the Conservatives. We're seeing a wave of right wing, even in Germany, right wing politics and politicians, you know, populists and et cetera, coming along with these more right-wing policies. And is it like history repeating itself? 
obviously everyone when Hitler was it when he took was it the Yugoslavia? I can't remember the first country he took, and he got that signed off by the British, by Chamberlain. They didn't fight him. They just was it Austria? I can't remember. It was some country that Germany that uh, Hitler took. Um, and basically the British just let him do it and signed it off and didn't fight for him because they thought that if they gave him this, he would be that would be it and he wouldn't, you know, and this is a bit similar to Crimea and Putin. And obviously no one thought that Hitler would carry on. Same as that they talk about Putin. Oh, no, it's just going to be Yugosla it's just going to be Ukraine. And are we, you know, uh, is this history repeating itself? It feels very, look at the rise of anti-Semitism that's coming around the world. I mean, that, I know some that's because of the treatment of the government in, in, in what they're doing in Gaza. But even before that, there was a rise of anti-Semitism, the same that we saw in the 30s. I mean, I know it's always been around. But it, it feels very worrying this time that are we approaching a similar kind of time? Everyone's always talking about Nostradamus and the World War Three and etc. Um, and everyone's obviously always worried about World War Three. And you hear commentators and politicians talk about it. Even Donald Trump talks about World War Three. Although Donald Trump's a populist and a scaremonger, he likes to, you know, make, have those sound bites. But it is. It does seem that there's a lot of parallels. I think the world is on a very dangerous edge. We could be living in in a good time at the moment, but tomorrow, who knows what can come? And now I'm starting to get like an idiot. Anyway, I just thought I'd bring that to you. Take care, take it easy. God bless. Indeed. Leave your comments.